self-inflicted. That is, it's people suffering from decisions that they've made or want to make or can't make that somehow reside within their locus of control. And there's something about that that's, of course, maddening, but there's also the fact that you have some control over that. And the letters that we considered this week are really chilling because they are about people who suffer misfortune. And those misfortunes are more long-term and maybe even permanent. Yeah. But then the other part of it that really haunted me and sent me into this little kind of thought spiral that took me back to my college days when I was in either a religion or anthropology class and came across this idea of theodicy, which is this branch of theology engaged with this central struggle, which is what do we do when the righteous suffer? How do we contend with the imperfections of the world when bad things happen to people who are completely undeserving of bad things, right? There's this idea of divine justice. If you behave righteously, you should be rewarded. If you behave in an iniquitous manner, you should be punished. So what do we do with the vast number of people, like our letter writers this week, who have done nothing wrong and have had major blows dealt to them. What do we do with that quandary? And kind of the Ur text for this is the book of Job, which is this book in which God essentially visits every kind of horror imaginable, everything on this righteous man, Job. You know, Job refuses to renounce in the face of anything and everything, refuses to renounce his faith in God. And of course, at the end of the book of Job, he is rewarded, you know, 10 times over. And that's a really lovely thing to believe, but that is not actually how life operates for many people. It's kind of really an American idea, isn't it, too? Yeah. The, the premise of, of our lives is like, do good and good things will happen. Right. What we really know, though, is that equation doesn't always come out so well for some of us. And certainly the two letters we're going to talk about today, that is the case. I don't want to leap ahead into the letters before we read them, but I'm going to. One of the, the things that these letters have in common, and they, they do have quite a bit in common, even though they're, they're very different stories, is that both of the letter writers are asking us, how do I get my joy back? There are people who are saying, I used to be happy, yeah. and now I'm not. And how do I get back to that place? And just that very question implies, and and certainly I've asked that question in times of my own life when I've suffered losses. And I think that what part of that is, is really uh, that expectation that happiness is ours. And of course, that is, you know, born of everything that we're taught in this culture, um, that we have a right to that, that we forget sometimes that life is suffering. Yeah. So let's hear this first letter. Dear Sugar. About five years ago, I was diagnosed with glaucoma, an eye condition that results in optic nerve damage due to abnormally high pressure inside the eyes. I had three different ophthalmologists tell me that there is no cure for this and that I will eventually go blind because of it, although I could be an old man by the time that happens, which did little to comfort me since A, I am now 40, and B, I am an artist and graphic designer and rely on my sight for my livelihood. Ever since I learned of my impending blindness, I have lost the will to live my life. I am not talking about suicide. I simply mean that life has ceased to have any real meaning for me. It feels over and therefore not worth caring about. I no longer feel the need to strive for greatness or even to improve myself. What's the point is a constant question in my mind, not to mention the fact that I have major depression. I don't know how to get out of this funk or even where to begin to stop feeling betrayed by my own body. I've considered going back to therapy, which I've done a few times throughout my life, but even that seems pointless. I know there is no easy answer to this, but any advice, even a friendly ear, would be most appreciated. Signed, No Hope for a Good Life. Mm. My sympathies, No Hope. It really is such a hard diagnosis, and I can absolutely understand why you would feel so despairing about your life and your future. But one thing that's just absolutely clear to me is that you say not to mention the fact that I have major depression. But what I want to say is that is the fact that you need to mention the most. That is the central fact. And, you know, your letter reads to me like somebody who has major depression. Yeah. This is a a letter, really, I guess we could say about a loss of faith. Yeah. I mean, no hope. You are having taken from you the thing, the sense that feels most precious to you. It feels Jobian in its specific kind of, it's like retribution. 
So there is some sense, or for me anyway, I always have this Old Testament feeling about, oh man, this guy is going through a trial, and what he needs is faith. But the truth of the matter is, now in this time, we're not in the Middle Ages, there's also an awareness that the body has a tendency to be able to find faith and hope if it's at a certain sustainable level of serotonin or whatever it is. You know, he's got this horrible misfortune that to him has literally cast his life into darkness Mm -hmm. or occluded his sense of joy in life. And the depression is also a lens that's over his life. That depression is a dark scrim that is over his life that is forbidding any kind of light from entering it. And until he gets that lens off, he can't even realistically look at the struggle to feel okay Mm -hmm. about what his life is going to be like with less vision, with less sight. Right. Um, And I want to also read you No Hope, just because it also immediately came to mind, a piece of writing called Blindness by the writer Borges. Um, wonderful Argentinian writer, and this is one of my favorite things that he ever wrote. And it is literally about his blindness. He didn't suffer from glaucoma, but he suffered from a congenital disease that caused him to lose his sight gradually. Uh, And I I just want you to listen to it, and, and I hope that it provides some solace for you. It's just a few little paragraphs from blindness. I will begin then by referring to my own modest blindness. Modest because it is total blindness in one eye, but only partial in the other, I can still make out certain colors. I can still see blue and green, and yellow in particular has remained faithful to me. I remember when I was young, I used to linger in front of certain cages in the Palermo Zoo, the cages of the tigers and leopards. I lingered before the tigers, gold and black. Yellow is still with me, even now. I live in that world of colors, and if I speak of my own modest blindness, I do so first because it is not that perfect blindness which people imagine, and second, because it deals with me. My case is not especially dramatic. What is dramatic are those who suddenly lose their sight. In my case, that slow nightfall, that slow loss of sight, began in what I began to see. I did not allow blindness to intimidate me, Blindness has not been for me a total misfortune. It should not be seen in a pathetic way. It should not be seen as a way of life, only as one of the styles of living. And he goes on for some pages. Mm -hmm. But I thought about you, No Hope, because Borges has, has thought and meditated on what other people would take to be an essential disability that is robbing him of the pleasure of reading Mm -hmm. and so forth. It's not as particular because no hope, I get it, you're an artist, you're a visual artist, and that sense being taken from you feels especially precious and cruel. But Borges is trying to say, listen, it's a slow nightfall, and even in the darkness there's some beauty. Right. You know, I, I agree with you entirely that literature is such a consolation. It's certainly been a consolation to me. Whenever bad things happen to us, I think it's very, very common to have a lot of self-pity and to say, why me? And I found in my own life that whenever I'm in that spiral, when I'm resenting the bad things that have happened to me or the the burdens that I've had to bear, uh, it really is very helpful for me to get out of my own life and get out of my own head. Yeah. And, and the truth is, is that as hard as this is, and I do not mean to diminish the sorrow of this, I, I would feel despair too. The truth is that on the other side of that are a whole bunch of people who have continued to have beautiful, thriving, rich, relevant, interesting lives full of hope and love and joy. Right. And I do think that that in some ways I can absolutely understand this despair and in some ways resisting those stories. But I also think that there is company in knowing those stories. Right. I think, too, whenever we are confronted with these struggles in life, with with news that we wish that we hadn't gotten, with truths we wish we didn't know, it's always really powerful to take the long view. Mm-hmm. to try to pull back from your daily life and think about the life that you hoped that you lived looking back upon it. And to me, whenever I've felt, you know, sort of down on my knees and giving up and without hope and most despairing, having that kind of perspective has helped me get back up onto my feet. Do I want to be the sort of person who allows the bad news 
to destroy me, to right. collapse me, to keep me in place? Or do I want to be the sort of person who rises in the face of adversity, who embraces the challenges of these difficult times and moves beyond and past it? And every time I've asked myself that question, it becomes abundantly clear how to move forward. It's not a death sentence to become blind. Right. And I would encourage No Hope to get that help he needs to deal with that depression so he can see the truth of that, because it is true. Right. As sad as this diagnosis is, it's also true that it is not a death sentence. And, you know, as Boreas suggests, you know, yellow is with me still. The appreciation that he feels for color mm-hmm. is actually something that no sighted person can fully understand. Yeah. You now recognize in a way that was never even clear to you as a graphic artist how precious it is, what sight you have, mm-hmm. what colors are. And I think that's partly what Borges is writing about. When I first read that piece, I remember it was probably 15 or 20 years ago, and I just remember thinking, wow, to feel so intensely grateful to a color, like to feel that kind of gratitude mm-hmm. at the miracle of the world around us and, and the senses that we have to take it in. Uh, I don't want it to sound Pollyannish, but Borges is really talking about faith and gratitude. Yeah. And yes, there, you know, he did lose his vision, but man, what he did with it when he had it. No hope. You're an artist. That's part of what you do. So rather than running away from the glaucoma, rather than seeing it as the enemy or the invader, in a certain way, you're seeing the world in a very different way than normally sighted people do. Absolutely. And as a visual artist, you have an opportunity to make people understand, as Borges tried to make people understand, how precious it is. So that's Again, once you've taken care of the depression and that underlying struggle to feel good about things, you might think about that. What gifts do you have that can clarify how you see the world now? Mm -hmm. We wish you luck. We are on your side. And we know in our hearts that you can live with beauty and light. That's right. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR in the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from The New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. So, sure, we have a second letter. And um, this letter is, is um, I mean, we're going we're gonna to try to find the light, but it's a, it's a pretty dark letter. And, um, and you know, beautiful and true, but, but also pretty rough terrain, so let, let's just listen to it. Dear Sugars, my daughter was born three and a half years ago with a congenital heart disorder. In essence, she was born with half a heart. Even just 10 or 15 years ago, she wouldn't have survived. The science in this area has grown by leaps and bounds, but still includes three staged open heart surgeries, possible transplants, many hospitalizations, and a very uncertain outcome and life expectancy. We spent 11 months in the hospital after she was born, all of us fighting for her life. She ended up going through numerous surgeries, and we had to endure seeing her in constant pain, and we were faced with heavy life and death decisions. The first year she was home was torture. She didn't sleep. Her feeding tube made her vomit endlessly. She couldn't walk until she was two, talk until she was three, and she's still very behind in development. I'm so proud of her achievements, but it's painful to see her next to her peers, who can talk and run and jump. In addition to this, my husband and I are having marital problems, exacerbated by him being recently diagnosed as bipolar, 
and suffering from wild mood swings. I've been diagnosed with an unknown spinal lesion, one that could be cancerous, and now a lump in my neck that is being followed up on. I believe our health has suffered considerably from the stress we've gone through. Sugars, these three years have changed me. I don't know if I can recognize myself. I've become so afraid. A germaphobe, scared of accidents, doctor visits. I'm afraid my daughter will end up back in the hospital, and I'm afraid to leave her with others. I'm scared all the time. Each decision I make feels like it has a heavy what-if attached to it. I'm also beyond burnt out in feeling the ravages of depression and apathy towards being a mom. I feel broken, like my insides have been scraped out. I'm jealous, so horribly and embarrassingly jealous of families that seemingly don't have a care in the world. I've honestly started hating my friends for having happy, carefree lives. Our daughter is scheduled to go back for her third open-heart surgery in a few months, and we're looking at possibly spending months in the hospital again. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I want to see myself in the mirror again. I want to stop making decisions based on fear and hurt. I want something of my own. I want to stop feeling those red-hot flames of jealousy. I want to love my daughter without being terrified of losing her. Above all, I want advice on how to live a life I wouldn't have chosen if I had a choice. To not just survive it, but to make something positive with it and learn how to live with an unknown future ahead of us. How can I let go of what these past few years have done to me, to my family, and my hope? How can I survive this stressed out, uncertain, and sometimes heartbreaking existence? Signed, Half a Heart. Well, we talked at the beginning about Job, and, you know, as I listen to the catalog of misfortune that this woman has experienced, it just, you know, it, w- it would be enough to have a child who has significant health problems and you're terrified. And then on top of that, of course, there's stress on the marriage, but the husband is, you know, bipolar and that's difficult to manage. And then there's a health risk that half a heart you're struggling with, which is terrifying in its own way. Um, And I I thought about this friend of mine who um, he and his wife uh, just got a terrible diagnosis at birth. And um, I felt really terrible for him. I, I didn't know what to do. And so I I sent him this poem that I read, I don't know, years ago by the poet John Stallworthy, and and it always um, kind of haunted me and stayed with me. And then I I read it again um, when I I read this letter. I'm not going to read all of it, but I just want to read a little portion of it. Please do. Yeah, so this is the poem, The Almond Tree. And I'll just set it up by saying that this is there's this young father who's racing to the hospital, um, and his first child is, is just about to be born. And he arrives, and he parks in the shade of this almond tree, and he races upstairs, and he's so thrilled to meet his new son. And, you know, he sees the birth, and the son is given to him, and, and then the doctor takes him aside and tells him that his son is Down syndrome. This was written several decades ago, and he's just plunged into absolute grief and shock by receiving this diagnosis. And and I'll just read a, a little bit of this, John Stallworthy's The Almond Tree. How easily the word went in, clean as a bullet, leaving no mark on the skin, stopping the heart within it. This was my first death. In a numbered cot, my son sailed from me, never to come ashore into my kingdom, speaking my language. Better not look that way. The almond tree was beautiful in labor, blood dark, quickening, bud after bud split, flower after flower shook free. On the darkening wind, a pale face floated out of reach. Only when the buds, all the buds, were broken would the tree be in full sail. In labor, the tree was becoming itself. I, too, rooted in earth and ringed by darkness, from the death of myself, saw myself blossoming, wrenched from the call of my thirty years growing, fathered by my son, unkindly in a kind season, by love shattered and set free. Mm. What struck me so powerfully, Cheryl, was the idea that there are certain experiences where regeneration only happens after every bud has burst after mm. every bit of it has been broken, and that th- there you are sometimes wrenched from the call of your own experience by certain tragedies. 
And those tragedies, in a sense, become your parent. Um, and the only thing that you can do is be shattered by it. As I thought about this letter, I thought there is no pep talk that we could instill or, or even as inspiring words that I would attempt to muster in the face of this much bad data, this much struggle. Not that it's hopeless at all, but that it, it, there is so much for her to get through and to resist the urge to feel that it's even reasonable to, to think, for instance, that she's going to think about her daughter without worrying about her daughter's life and survival. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that experience, and this in some ways echoes back to that idea of uh, theodicy, you know, sometimes there is no logical, reasonable explanation for what human beings are asked to withstand. And the only thing they get is that they somehow contend with those things and are tested. And the only thing they can do is esteem everything that they're struggling with. At the bottom of a letter like this, it seems to me, is the idea that you cannot regenerate. That, that almond tree, that human spirit, is not going to regenerate until you experience every bit of how shattered you are by misfortune on this scale. Right. And when we talk about that, what we're talking about is not hopelessness, but sorrow. And right. there is a difference. Uh, you know, as with the previous letter from No Hope for a Good Life, what half a heart shares with him is this sense of not just sorrow, but hopelessness. And that's where we can sometimes get stuck. And I think sometimes we get stuck in that place because we mistake, you know, one for the other. I want to just say to half a heart, first of all, I'm so sorry that you have and your family have had to deal with such a painful and difficult thing. But the fact is, this is what you've had to deal with. Your daughter was born with this condition. You now have this life that isn't of your choosing. In your final sentences of your letter, you're saying, I want to stop making decisions based on fear and hurt. I want something of my own. I want to stop these feelings of fear, being afraid that I'm going to lose my daughter. And I think that you're not going to get to stop doing that. Right. And so when you have a situation that you can't control, that you don't get to choose, the only thing you can do is figure out how to accept it. Right. That idea of a daughter who was born healthy and a, those carefree families that you see, the reason you feel jealous of them is because that's the life you expected to have. That's the life you want and the life you imagine for yourself. And this is an opportunity, I think, for you to say to yourself, it's okay that I don't want to accept it, to rail against that, yep. and to feel and in, fully inhabit that sorrow you have about not getting the life you wanted. Yeah. The line that was frightening is this idea of depression and apathy, especially towards being a mom, uh, taking over, because that, to me, is, is the, the, the real danger, in, that in the face of, of this constant fear and, and rage and jealousy and all the feelings that actually feel to me completely reasonable and actually inevitable, that you mm -hmm. would choose in the face of that every day to just say, you know what, I cannot continue to love and care about this daughter who may be taken from me, you know, to essentially say, I'm just going to numb myself out. But that is the thing that is the killing experience. The, the much tougher course is to actually at the moment feel everything that you feel and not judge it or not try to improve it or reach for some other set of feelings th until they really come to you authentically. You know, I too rooted in earth and ringed by darkness from the death of myself saw myself blossoming like there's no other way. You have to be ringed in darkness for a while. And I feel like that's where you are half a heart and you shouldn't try to fight it. Y you know, you're feeling the full force of all of these ridiculous, insane, absurd, cruel misfortunes. And yeah. that's where it is right now. One line in your letter really struck me. I want to love my daughter without being terrified of losing her. And of course, you know, this idea of losing her is, you know, front and center and has been there with you for every day of her life. And that isn't to be compared to a parent who has, you know, a child who doesn't have a health condition. But I will say that, you know, a piece of that rings true, I think, for all parents, you know, the deal with loving our children is that we sometime might lose them. Yep. And I think that maybe taking down your sorrow to like the moment, the day, we don't know what's going to happen. None of us know what's going to happen with our kids. Yeah. But you can love your daughter on that day. You can be there for her on that day. You can witness how that day is blossoming in your life. 
and not really be thinking about, you know, what's next, because the deal is we don't know what's next. That's None right. of us do. That's right. I, it's so funny, sure, when I read this letter, and then I was, you know, I read this poem, and then I read the letter again, and I was sitting in my house and kind of sitting with this letter, and I just had this weird thought of my d- kids were all asleep, and I just thought, wow, there are these three little hearts beating in my house, mm-hmm. and... I don't know what's going to happen to them. And any time mm-hmm. I even step into the neighborhood where something bad could happen to them, I completely freak out and just cannot handle it. And, and I don't know if I would be able to handle it. And that's part of what I want to say to Half a Heart as well. I, you are handling it. You know, you didn't just stumble. You got knocked down. And then while you were down on the ground, you got kicked a few times. Mm-hmm. And to even withstand that and to be tested in that way and still be able to get your head around what you're struggling with and the questions that you want to be able to answer and the good outcomes that you want to be able to reach is pretty extraordinary. One of the things that happens when you suffer a lot of misfortune is that it very quickly can curdle into a kind of self-pity. And I don't feel that here. I feel somebody honestly grappling with the fact that they know that it's dark to feel jealous and envious, and they know that they should be more dignified and more noble. Those are the stories we tell about ourselves until something really bad happens, and then we figure out who we are. And it's a great thing to say, I want to reach this point where I'm no longer so terrified all the time and I'm not jealous and I'm not plagued by these thoughts. But you know what? Even to withstand it in the moment is a big thing. You know, most people are just not tested in this way. The fact Mm -hmm. that you are thinking about your life and examining it as painful as it is, that is all you can do at the moment. Yeah, I think that one of the challenges in us choosing a letter like this for our show, Steve, I think is I I always feel, I'll just speak for myself, is I feel like, who am I to give half a heart advice? Like, I haven't suffered in these same ways. And I don't have to, you know, think about these questions on a daily basis with my own children. And it's also the reason that I felt so strongly that we should have it on the show. Because I guess the bit that I feel like that we can offer is that sense of distance and perspective. We have the luxury of sort of stepping back and looking at your life and the lives of the other letters that we talk about on this show with some distance. And we can very clearly see that this is really hard right now. But as you know, life moves on. Something will happen. Things will change over time. Your daughter will either get better or not. But your life will unfurl as it does. And people have all kinds of experiences, both positive and negative, horrific and beautiful. And we do find a way to live with them. Whenever I read sort of advice, you know, from people who live to be 100 or, you know, people who have been through all sorts of things, they always come back to this idea of resilience. The deal isn't like, well, you, you had a good life if nothing bad happened to you, right? right? The deal is you had a good life if you were able to respond, if you were capable of finding a way to get up after you fell down. And I think that half a heart you're writing to us from this moment where you're down there that you fell down, that this really difficult thing has happened to you and your family. And you guys, you know, you're going to be down there maybe for another while. When you move beyond that sorrow is when you start, I think, answering those other questions you have, that you don't want to just survive that sorrow. You want to make something positive with it. You know, you're not, you're just not there yet. But those things are to come. One of the things I can tell you right now that you absolutely have half a heart is A story that's going to be so important to so many people, so many of our listeners who are in your situation, who have family members, children with illnesses, they're asking those same questions you're asking. And one of the things that you can do with your sorrow always is to to decide to be resilient about it, to decide that it's not going to be the thing that defines your life or your daughter's life or your family, even when the worst outcome happens. One of my friends, Emily Rapp, wrote a beautiful memoir called Mm -hmm. The Still Point of the Turning World. And her son died, and she found out when he was about one that that he did have a terminal congenital disorder. What she did to survive it, to do more than to survive it, is she wrote about her rage and her jealousy and her sorrow and the unfairness of it and the how did I get this life that I don't get to control uh, questions. And by doing that, she both elucidated the dark corners of her own suffering, and she also illuminated that experience for so many people, people who who don't have that 